Hello class, I'm Professor Dwight Hughes. This is Chapter 1, Routing Concepts for the Clark College Intech 222 Cisco CCNA 2 course. In this chapter, we'll take a look at router initial configuration, routing decisions, and router operation. Let's start with initial configuration. The characteristics of a router today have many jobs that the router is involved in and many considerations with a router. It would have to do with things like your network topology. Do you have a large, complex enterprise topology? Is it a more simple, basic topology like a SOHO, a small office, home office, or something in between? What kind of speeds do you need? Do you need gigabit ethernet ports, 10 gigabit ports? Can you get by with FA, that's fast ethernet, ports that are maybe 100 megabits per second? What kind of cost? What's your budget? How much money can you spend? What type of security features do you need? Will you be utilizing uh, VPN, which is an encrypted communication technique? Or will you need uh, firewall protection? And what kind of availability? Availability is a, a, essentially the ability for the device to buy more than one of them and be highly available, meaning if, if one uh, becomes congested or unavailable, another one can step in. So that would be your availability. A scalability is the ability to do things like add additional cards, additional uh, RAM, additional CPUs, that sort of thing. And finally, reliability. How reliable is it? And reliability is usually done through redundancy. And that would mean things like a router with two or more fans, with two or more um, motherboards, and that sort of uh, redundant componentry. Those are the main characteristics that you're going to need to look at when you're deciding which router fits your needs. The router is responsible for the routing of traffic between networks. So we don't see a lot of routers operating within a network that would be within a LAN. That's done today predominantly with switches, but every company and every home and every business has a router and it's uh, commonly called the gateway. Some people even confusingly call it a modem. But it is the device that connects your home LAN or your work LAN onto the internet. So you have a router that acts as your gateway between your network and the other networks. Routers are computers too. They have CPUs. They have RAM. They actually have storage. They use a uh, um, NVRAM storage with non-volatile RAM. They use a flash is uh, basically like a hard drive. And they run an operating system. The operating system is customized, much like the operating system on a cell phone. If you have one of those smartphones, an Android phone, or a Windows phone, or an Apple iPhone, you know that you have a full operating system. It does a whole bunch of stuff, but it is optimized to work on that small device. Well, similarly, you have a full operating system on a router but it is optimized to do routing. This is a look at the physical side of a router. This would be the back side. The back side's the interesting side with all the ports. The front just has a Cisco logo and some blinking lights. So on the back side, we see um, some expansion ports to put flashcards in. Remember that flash is a non-volatile storage. It's like a USB flash stick that you might have as a student. And these flash cards, um, maybe you have a laptop that has an SSD drive, a solid state drive, that would be flash. So it essentially is the hard drive of the router. And in most newer routers, you can install up to two of them. You have some expansion slots, and this is that scalability. Cheaper routers have fewer or no expansion slots. More expensive routers have more expansion slots. The same goes for the flash card slots, etc. There are some built-in ports, and uh, the built-in ports you can normally see would be some type of a console port for connecting a console cable, and this router has two options. You could use a RJ45 rollover cable, or you could use a USB cable, similar to the USB cable you might use with a um, camera, digital camera would use the, the Mini-B standard. 
You have some USB ports, and those are for those flash thumb drives that you may have. You can plug those right in there. And you have, in this case, two LAN interfaces. Here's just a look at all of that and what's stored where. And that's really a lot about what your notes are going to need to have is what goes into RAM? Everything. So when the router boots up, it loads everything. It puts the operating system called iOS in the RAM. It puts the configuration file into RAM. It puts all the tables and the buffers and everything else gets loaded into RAM. RAM, as you may know, uh, disappears. The contents of it disappear when you power off or power cycle the device. So it's a temporary storage area. Then we have several more permanent areas where we store these components. In ROM, we're going to store the boot up files. That's going to be something called the bootstrap and the post power on self test and some other software that is used every time you power on the device. In a computer, you might call this the BIOS. So this would be roughly analogous to the BIOS of a PC. Then you would have some NVRAM and that in the past was RAM with a little battery glued to it. Today it's actually just flash. So NVRAM, we still call it NVRAM, but it's essentially flash. And what you store there is your configuration that you're typing into the router. So any of the commands that you've typed in would be stored there in the NVRAM. And then flash, which is like your hard drive, is where you store the operating system and you might store uh, backups of your config files and pretty much anything else that you want. Routers interconnect networks. Routers choose best, path, best paths. In fact, making best path decisions is the primary job of the router. Routers can do a lot of things, but their primary job is choosing best paths. Switches don't do that. Switches just switch. They quickly find a route to the destination and they switch it. A router inspects all available routes, compares them using metrics. Those would be decision criteria, like could be distance or delay or reliability or other factors, and it considers those for each path available to a given destination, and it will choose the best path. It then forwards it to the correct interface, which is really what a switch does. So it has a switching component at the end after it does this thinking. And the thinking is done by what we call dynamic routing protocols. They have the ability to learn the paths to the destinations and develop routing tables to compare those paths. Okay, we have several packet forwarding methods. The main difference is going to be speed or performance. So we can use process switching, which is an old fashioned way of routing. And process switching is going to use the CPU and um, be processor intensive, so it's slow. And it's available on all routers. All routers support process switching. Then we have something a little faster called fast switching. And what it does is it stores previously used routes in a cache. So it speeds up routing. So if you've been somewhere previously in, in the recent few, uh, past, uh, it will be able to just grab that route and use it again without having to process what a best path is. It'll use the kind of most recently used. An analogy for that would be a modern hard drive has something called cache and modern CPUs also have cache. And those are just a, a quick reference um, storage area. In fact, you, you might use something similar analogous to that with you Microsoft Office. If you've ever opened Word or Excel and you've gone to Open Recent. So you could go File, Open Recent, and it gives you a list of the last, say, 10 files that you opened. So it's kind of a quick, fast way to pull something up that you've used recently. That's what this would be, and it speeds things up for commonly used paths would route faster. Now, if it's not in the cache, it would fall back to using process switching. So it would check its cache first, and if there wasn't information in the cache about the destination you were trying to reach, it would revert back to process switching. Enter the newest version of Cisco routing called Ceph, or Cisco Express Forwarding. That is the absolute fastest preferred method for forwarding, and it requires um, 
a special table to be maintained. It maintains a um, special routing table. In fact, you can type the command show IP Ceph and see that table. It's running all the time on the routers in our lab. So if you're in NetLab or you're in our laboratory, try typing show IP Ceph and it will show you that information. Right, this is just, again, this diagram they keep showing to emphasize the uh, placement of routers in a network. And you can see that the routers are predominantly placed at the, at the edges of the network, but not always. In the home office, the router does everything. You can see that there, it's really the central point in a home network. The router is this central device connecting everything and then connected your cable modem or your DSL modem. And that, there you have an actual modem, correct? So. Then if we go down to like central offices, branch offices, kind of your enterprise and larger businesses, the router sits at the edge. It is the connection to the internet. And you don't see routers in the LAN very much. In fact, you're not seeing them in these diagrams at all. Switches are what's handling all of the um, interconnectedness within the company. So as we mentioned earlier, routers are sometimes called gateways. And the default gateway would be the primary way you get out of the network. So the default, like if you're in a room and a room had multiple doors, our classroom at Clark College has multiple doors in and out of the room, but there's one door that we would say is the default way in and out of the room. So networks are the same way. They may have only one way. They still, that you call that the default. There just is no, uh, no other alternative. But some of the networks will have more than one, maybe five or six different ways to get to the internet, but you'll still have a default way. So you'll wanna define for each device on the network, each device, every printer, every PC, every server, they all need to know their default and that's their default door to use to exit the part of the network they're in. You'll want to document the network addressing. Before you ever start configuring the router, you need to know all of the IP addressing for all of the network. And it would look like something in this table right here. Notice that routers do not have default gateways, because remember, they are the gateways. So routers do not have default gateways themselves, they are the default gateway. So you'll see the devices specify default gateways. And if you look closely for PC1 and PC2, those default gateways that they're assigned correspond to interfaces on router one and router two. You also need to track device names, the interfaces on the device that are being used, the IP addresses and the subnet mass and then the default gateways. You'll notice in this diagram, the PCs, they put an NA there because there's only one interface, so they're not bothering to specify it. But a lot of modern PCs, especially laptops, may have two or three different interfaces. You might have uh, one for a cellular network, you might have one for a Wi-Fi network, and uh, one for a wired uh, network. And on servers, it's very common to have two or even four wired um, interfaces on the server PC. So in that case, you would need to specify which IP is on which interface. You have two options for putting IP addresses on a host device. A host would be a PC, a printer, a phone. You could do it statically. That means you manually go to each device physically and you type in the information. Put in any of the parameters for the network, like a IP address, a um, mask, a subnet mask, a default gateway, perhaps a DNS server, uh, perhaps some other server information and you could do that on every device. This typically is not done because it doesn't scale well. It's labor intensive and it's error prone. The preferred way to put IP information on your devices would be using DHCP or dynamically, in which case you set up a server and that DHCP server could be set up on a Cisco router. And we'll be doing that in this class. And your hosts, when they power on, simply request their information over the network and the router provides all of the network settings they need out of a pool of settings. This is just an illustration of doing it statically. 
and this is an illustration of doing it dynamically. You'll have labs where you get to set up both methods. This is highlighting the indicator lights that you'll find on almost every port on a router. Indicator lights are very helpful to diagnose and troubleshoot what's going on. I can look at a light and if I see a green light, a blinking light would indicate that there was some type of traffic, right? Some type of, uh, of traffic going through the interface. So you can see here some codes on the color of the light and uh, indicating different things that are happening with the port. Console access. Well, we know that routers come blank from the factory and they have no configuration, no IP address, and are not operational until we uh, connect to them with a terminal application and configure them with some commands. So we'll need a laptop or a desktop PC running special terminal emulation software. We, in our class, use PuTTY, but in this example, they also illustrate TerraTerm, and there are many others. And then we need a special cable, and we could use either a USB cable or an RJ45 console cable called a rollover cable. And since our PC doesn't have an RJ45 port, we will get an adapter that you put on the DB9 serial port to convert that to an RJ45. You can also, by the way, get an adapter for a USB port. If you have a laptop and you have USB ports, you can get an adapter for around five or six dollars that um, has a dongle that plugs in a USB port and provides you an RJ45 um, console port or a DB9 port. So there's many ways we can adapt any device you have to be able to console into these um, Cisco routers. Let's talk about switches for a minute. Switches also need an IP address and a default gateway. They actually get the same settings that you'd give a PC. We often give them an IP address and a subnet mask, and we assign them a default gateway. And occasionally we even assign them a DNS server. The reason that we do that is to allow us to remotely connect to the switch command line later. So although initially with a switch, we must also use a console cable to configure it, we may want to return to the switch and change the configuration in the future. And we can do that remotely without ever plugging in a special cable if we've assigned it some IP settings. We also need to give it a password and some other things, but this is highlighting putting the IP settings. So even if you don't want to remotely access the switch later, the IP settings are still helpful so you can use the ping utility or the traceroute utility to do some troubleshooting on your network. Say you were over there at PC3 and you couldn't reach PC1. You were unable to, to make a successful connection. One strategy might be to ping each device between PC3 and PC1, and I would probably start the furthest out. So I'd try to ping switch one at 192.168.10.2. And if that was successful, it would isolate the problem to PC1 or the cable from PC1 to switch one, greatly reducing the time it would take me to troubleshoot the problem. Let's talk about configuring router basic settings. Every router should have a device name. By default, routers are named router. Switches are named switch. Notice in this example, the name of the router has been changed to be R1. I believe your name can be up to about 32 characters long. I don't believe your name can start with a number and uh, Otherwise, you can't use spaces, so use dashes or underscores if you, uh, if you need to have a, a longer name. Occasionally, the company I work for, our routers were um, given inventory ID numbers, so the, the name was the inventory ID number, and those got quite long and cryptic. We had uh, hundreds and hundreds of routers, though, in our ISP network. I worked for a state university, and we named our routers after trees. So, you know, we would have, uh, like, maple and... <laughs> Elm, and so these were the different uh, routers that we had. So each company will kind of come up with its own naming scheme, perhaps, for how you name your devices. Occasionally, they might be named by location, like Los Angeles, and so I've seen them uh, named after the airport monikers, like LAX, PDX, SEA, things like that. 
Okay, secure management access. So that's what we're talking about, that remote connectivity. So you want to set up some type of remote connection and we typically don't want to use Telnet. Telnet is mentioned here, but we would want to use SSH. And we'll be looking at in this class how to configure SSH, but not in this chapter. So it's okay to go ahead and set up Telnet, but Telnet is inherently insecure because it's unencrypted. We'd also want a banner message that provides a legal notification of unauthorized access. Essentially, a banner that comes up at the login screen to notify uh, would-be login folks about the consequences of trying to break into the device if they're not authorized. And then we want to save the configuration. Right. So this is an example of configuring an IPv4 address for a router interface. Go into the interface from the configuration mode. You choose the interface you want. Uh, you may give the interface a description that's optional but recommended. And then you can assign it an IP address and a mask. And the final thing you need to do is type no shut down. And what that will do, and you can abbreviate that no shut, is turn the interface on. By default, all interfaces on the router are turned off until you activate them. It's essentially the same process for an IPv6 address as you can see here. There are a few extra steps that I'll cover in my example configuration on our class website because you have to first enable IPv6 for this to work properly. IPv6 by default and IPv6 routing by default are disabled on routers today. So this uh, config snippet assumes or presumes that IPv6 has been enabled on the router for this to function correctly. You know, this is another little misnomer because IPv4 interfaces can also support more than one address. It's just not commonly done. But if you were using the IPv4 command, I'll go back to it for a moment. You can actually type um, IP address and then add the, add the word secondary at the end of this. And so after you type the address in the mask, you can add the word secondary and it will actually add it as an appended as a second IP address on that interface rather than if you don't add that word, it would just replace um, the address you had there before. But IPv6 is intentionally designed to support more than one IP address. Uh, in fact, you often need two or three of them just to get an interface to work correctly because you will have a link local always that last bullet point says configure a link local. One is created for you automatically. You can configure one so that uh, it is a little easier for you to use because the one that's auto-created is quite long and ugly. So you may want to configure your own link local address, but it's optional. But a link local address will be there. Then you might want to have a global unicast address. And that would be a global address or uh, equivalent to a public IP in IPv4 that can be used uh, to reach anywhere in the world. A loopback interface is a fictitious, a made up interface. And we can just make these up inside the router. We can make as many of these fake interfaces as we want. In fact, you have one made up on every PC and device has a loopback, and you know it has a predefined IP address of 127001. That's the predefined IP address for a loopback, not on a router. Routers don't have loopbacks until you make them. So unlike a PC or other device that has a loopback already pre-established for you with a pre-established default IP address, the router does not. So on the router, we make our loopback interfaces just like any other interface, but we call it loopback zero, loopback one, loopback two, and so on. You can make an unlimited number of loopback interfaces and you can assign each one an IP address. They can then be pinged, um, trace routed, Telnet, SSH, so you could use them to remotely connect to the uh, router. 
What's nice about them is they never go up or down like a real interface that might go up or down if it loses its connectivity. A router that may have a lot of real interfaces, you might be able to route to the router on any number of interfaces. So if one or more of them had gone down, as long as any of the physical interfaces were up, you'd be able to get into the router through a loopback because it always stays up. You'll find that this ability of loopbacks to always be up will be critical when we configure the OSPF routing process. It needs to have stability, and so we're going to have the routing process use a loopback interface for stability. Then the final step, just like if you were working on someone's car and you fixed it, you'd want to verify it. You want to make sure the work you did worked, or if you were Fixing some dinner, you'd want to taste it before you served it to your guests or your family to make sure everything turned out all right. So with a router, we also want to verify everything with a series of show commands. We want to take a look at what the router has in its running config and make sure that matches what we thought we typed in there. Sometimes we might have mistyped something or some other calamity has happened, usually human error, that causes the router to either not, um, not register a command, so there may be a missing command, or there may be an extra command we hadn't intended to type. So we wanna look for those by scanning over the running config. Show IP route will show us our routing table. We wanna make sure that the routing table contains at least all of the directly connected interfaces. So if I'm looking at router one, my routing table should have three interfaces that are directly connected. and. Show IP interface brief is just a quick way I can look at my directly connected interfaces and verify what IP addresses they have and that they're actually turned on, which would be the up state under the status. That's looking at the routing table. C's are directly connected interfaces. And I'm just making sure that those are connected. We have very similar commands for doing the same thing with IPv6. We literally just add a v6 to the command and we get the same, uh, the same information. We can use filters. If we had a router that had a lot, a lengthy config, we might use a filter, sometimes called a pipe, to specify a certain section or say include or exclude or begin we can jump right to a certain section of the config. Like in this case, we want to look at the VTY interface. So we can say, show the running config, pipe, section, line, VTY, and we'll go right to the part of the config that is the line VTY. You'll notice that the Cisco configs are slightly indented and those, um, those denote the different section titles. Once you get used to looking at those and learning what the section titles is, it's very helpful to add that to your show command to jump right to the section of the config instead of having to scroll through the entire configuration. The command history feature is also very helpful. This allows you to go back and look at the last 10 commands that you typed. In this example, they're modifying that to allow you to look at the last 200 commands. I do a similar thing, although I set it to 100. 10 is a little limiting. We type a lot of commands, and sometimes I want to take a look at um, the 11th command, the 20th command, something I typed some time ago, and so I like to modify the terminal history. This has to be done before you want to look because you're telling it how many commands to remember in its buffer. So routers have a lot of capabilities, so usually 10 is inadequate, and I immediately, when I configure a router, set the terminal history size to 100. Then when you type show history, it will show the last 100 commands instead of the last 10. You can also use these shortcuts like Control P for an up arrow and Control N for a down arrow. Where these are helpful is some terminal emulation software does not support the arrow keys. If you end up um, having to use terminal emulation software that does not support arrow keys, you would have to use Control P and Control N to move up and down. Our next section, routing decisions. 
switching packets between networks. So routers, remember, have two jobs. One is to make a best path decision, and the other is to have a switching function where they're encapsulating and de-encapsulating the packet. So you can see here the PC starts at layer 7, goes down through all the layers to layer 1, shoots the packet out the interface, it arrives at router 1, and router 1 de-encapsulates it until it can read layer 3. It makes a routing decision, chooses an exit interface, and then it re-encapsulates and sends it out that exit interface. And that is repeated at router 2 and router 3. And then at PC2, it moves up the stack from layer 1 all the way up to layer 7. That's how the encapsulation and de-encapsulation of the packets occurs during the routing cycle. So packets are end-to-end. -end. So they are created by PC1, and although they're read by router 1 and router 2 and router 3, they are unaltered other than a, a particular field, which is going to be the um, time-to-live field, is decremented to ensure that that packet doesn't roam the internet forever. But with the exception of that field, the packet is left uh, intact for PC2 to read. So each device simply has to figure out how to get it to what's called the next hop, the next closest router to the destination. So PC1 would use its default gateway. It's a pretty easy one because PC1's been pre-configured with its default gateway. It simply sends the packet there. That would be router 1. Router 1 would actually look up in its table to find out where to send it that was the next router closest to PC2. Once it determined that that was router 2, it would need to convert router 2's IP address into a MAC address so it could complete the layer 2 frame. So it uses a protocol called ARP, which is a broadcast protocol, and it would send a shout out to router 2 that says, hey, I have your IP, what's your MAC? And router 2 would respond back with its MAC address, allowing router 1 to finish re-encapsulating the packet in a new frame and send it on its way. And this would happen again and again. This is in your online curriculum. I won't dwell on this decision matrix or flow chart, but you can kind of read this through if you like flow charts. This is how the router makes its forwarding decisions. Let's talk about best path. Remember I said the best path is selected by a routing protocol based on some metric that could be distance or delay or reliability. Different dynamic routing protocols use different metrics. So you would choose a different routing protocol depending on the metrics you are concerned with and other factors, of course. Uh, RIP, which is a fairly simple routing protocol, is limited to one metric called hop count. Remember, a hop is the next closest router. So a hop count is how many next closest routers there are between a source and a destination. It uses this as kind of a measurement of distance. Much like you might count the number of stop signs or stoplights between a um, source and a destination path you take on a road. It doesn't really tell you the distance, but it tells you kind of a metric that you could use, that one path had fewer stop signs and lights than another path. And so RIP will try to choose a path with fewer routers. The OSPF is going to use bandwidth as the primary metric. So it's going to find the highest amount of bandwidth and send the packet down that path. With EIGRP, it has um, four by default, but there's actually another two or three that you can enable beyond that. So it has probably the most comprehensive a number of metrics that you can use. It can use bandwidth like OSPF, but you can also compare delay, load, and reliability. Let's talk about load balancing. Load balancing is the concept that if you go through the process of finding a best path and you end up with two best paths, two equal, you have a tie, right? Sometimes this happens in a contest where You've got two best, you've got two best um, ones, and, and so you have to kind of split the prize, right? And so that's what they do here. They split the traffic between the best paths. 
So by default, most routing protocols can uh, handle up to about six or eight of these best paths that tie as the best. And it will just eeny, meeny, miny, mo. it will round robin the packets across them to kind of load balance the traffic across the best paths that it has determined. AD or administrative distance is helpful to the router for de determining reliability. That's going to tell the router which routing protocol has more reliable information. And so a lower number is better. So if you have a directly connected network, that trumps everything. So that means you're already there. If you have a static route that was configured by a human being, that's the next best thing because boy, your human administrator must know where to send these packets. And then it moves down from there. You can see then that EIGRP is considered more reliable than OSPF and certainly more than RIP and some of these other um, protocols. And so if the router is running more than one protocol, because that's a question, can routers run more than one routing protocol? Yes. So you could have a static route to the same destination that you have an EIGRP route that you also have an OSPF route. Of those three then, the router would choose the static route every time because it has a better administrative distance. But if it ran across a network where there wasn't a static route but it had an EIGRP and it had an OSPF, it would choose EIGRP over an OSPF route to that destination. And this is irregardless of the metrics. This is just based on reliability of the information. So this is the first thing the router really takes a look at when it's doing path determination is can it get the most reliable source of routing information? Let's look at router operation. That's our third and final topic today. A routing table is a file stored in RAM that contains information about your directly connected routes. Remember, those are the ones where you just typed interface, fast ethernet 00, IP address, blah, 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 no shut. That would create a directly connected interface. Then remote interfaces are ones that are not directly connected. Looking at the diagram provided, router one has three directly connected interfaces. However, the interfaces over on router two, the LANs on router two are not directly connected to router one. So those would be remote routes that would have to either be statically configured as a static route or dynamically learned through a dynamic routing protocol. They are not going to be initially available to router one to route to until router one learns about them. Routing table sources then. You have local interfaces. Those are your directly connected interfaces. Those are added automatically as soon as you create a new interface and give it an IP address and type no shut, it will generate a local route interface for that. So directly connected interfaces and local route interfaces are the same thing. And you'll see that in the routing table, you'll see a C and an L. The C is the directly connected interface and the L is the directly connected interface or the local route. The difference, if you look subtly in the routing table, if you're wondering why are they listed twice, the directly connected interface is going to be the IP address of the interface and the local route is going to have the, um, the subnetted uh, network interface. So instead of the actual IP of the interface, it will have the network ID for the interface. Then you have static routes. Those are ones you've manually configured to reach remote destinations. And you will have your dynamic routing protocol, whatever that would be. So this is a code table that shows up every time you type show IP route, and it helps you determine the codes that are listed in the far left column of the routing table. So you can see at the very bottom of the slide a D for that route. So if you said, gee, what's the D? The D, notice in the codes table, is for EIGRP. That means the source of that route came from the EIGRP routing protocol. So that route information was learned through the EIGRP routing protocol. This is kind of the anatomy of a route in a routing protocol. It would start over on the left with the source of the routing information, which would be you know, S for static and C for directly connected and D for EIGRP and O for OSPF and R for RIP and so on. And then it would have the destination network 
and then it would have the AD, which in this case is 90. That's the trustworthiness of this information. And then it would have the metric, the cost metric. That's the uh, number, both the AD and the cost metric, remember, are the numbers that are used to compare two candidate routes to the same destination. And you would choose the candidate route that had a lower AD. And if they had the same AD, you would choose the candidate route that had a lower metric number. And if they had the same metric number, you would load balance across them. It's that simple. This destination network then is reached uh, via this next hop router. And you can see that would be 209-165-200-226 would be the next hop closest router. And this information was learned five seconds ago. And the outgoing interface to get to that next hop router is the serial 000 interface. And you can see that this is an entry, obviously, for the R1 router. It all lines up with router 1's serial 000 interface. And it lines up with pointing to router 2's .226 um, next hop interface. Directly connected interfaces. When you first look at a routing table, there's nothing. It's an empty routing table. If you powered on a blank router and you type show IP route, there'd be nothing there, no routes. There won't be any routes until you put IP addresses on your interfaces. Each interface that has an IP address and is turned to a no shutdown status will show up in the routing table. Additionally, you have to manually or dynamically configure the remote networks for each router. This is that CNL that I mentioned earlier that defined the same network. These both define the same directly connected interface. The C is the interface and the L is the um, interface as well. So they're, they're listed there for you. So you can see the subtle difference in the IP addresses on those. IPv6 works the same way. Static routes. and default static routes can be implemented after directly connected interfaces are added. So first you want to get your directly connected interfaces configured. Then you can start adding static routes. Remember, you have to manually add static routes. It's labor intensive and error prone. One static route that we almost always see is the gateway of last resort, sometimes called the default route. The default route is the route to take if there isn't a route. So if I can't find the destination in the routing table, it's not there, the router will, without a default route, throw away the packet. Gives up. If you don't want that behavior, you have to establish or configure a default route. What the default route will do is tell the router where to send packets when it doesn't know where they go. That would typically be to the internet. So there's no way a router knows every destination on the internet. They're changing all the time. So normally we point the default route towards the exit door. We say if it's not here, it's got to be out there. That's the concept. You would know all the destinations within your company and organization, but you wouldn't know all the destinations on the internet. So you would simply point it as a default route towards your internet service provider or ISP router. Believe it or not, your ISP router has a default route pointing towards its ISP router and so on and so forth until at some point um, that packet either has the TTL expire, the time to live decrements each time and remember uh, is set as a maximum to 255. So after it goes through 255 routers, it won't go any further and it, it won't get there. But more than likely, it will, um, it will get there long before that. So how do you verify it? Take a look at it in your routing table. Make sure it looks sound. Here's a static route right here. Two of them, actually, to the two different lands on router one and we can see that those do match up with the 10.0 and 11.0 networks on router one and one of those says to go out the s00 interface to get there and that's correct and the other says to go to um, 209.165.200.225 which is also correct that's illustrating two different ways you can ride a static route method one you can tell it the exit interface to go towards the next hop destination or method two you can tell it the ip address of the next hop destination 
just looking at what we call a default route. These are static routes for IPv6. Same two networks, same example as IPv4, but using our IPv6 addressing. Dynamic routing is pretty cool because it automatically adjusts to changing network conditions. Where static routes, every time you add a network or move a network or change anything, you have to go in all the routers and update all the static routes that pertain to those changed or removed or added networks. With dynamic routing, you do not. They just pick them up and share them with their neighbors and it propagates across your network and everybody's updated within seconds. Pretty cool. So here's some of the common routing protocols that you will find in use. EIGRP, OSPF, ISIS, and RIP. Here are the IPv6 routing protocols that are supported. Yes, that's correct. So if your network is using both IPv4 and IPv6 addressing, you will need to run both an IPv4 routing protocol and an IPv6 routing protocol. So even if you're using EIGRP for IPv4, you'll have to run EIGRP for IPv6. They are separate tables. One table tracking all the IPv4 destinations and routes one table tracking all the IPv6. The cool thing about this is one day when your IPv4 is no more, you can just shut off the IPv4 routing protocol and leave the IPv6 one unencumbered. This is just showing that Router 1 has learned dynamically from the EIGRP protocol on Router 2 about the two destination networks on Router 2. Notice it's pretty much the same information as you would have typed in statically. It just learned it automatically. That concludes Chapter 1 for our Intech 222 Cisco CCNA2 course. See you next week for Chapter 2.